Standing roughly 20 feet tall and weighing over 5 metric tons, the Hrunting Yggdrasil Mark IX is similar in appearance to the larger Hrunting Yggdrasil Mark II armour system, which itself was the evolution of another Hrunting project. As we covered in our video on the prototype suit, Hrunting and Yggdrasil are two quite separate projects led by the Office of Naval Intelligence which were merged, where Yggdrasil's initiative was to re-engineer technologies from Project Mjolnir for applications in other branches of the UNSC, in particular vehicles. Hrunting was a completely separate powered exoskeleton program altogether. The two were merged due to overlapping fields of research and the inherent advancements in both projects that would come from pooling resources. The most significant platform that was born of this unity was the Mark IX, its spindly legs and tiny thorax giving it a passing resemblance to its namesake as do its weaponized arms, though it lacks the sheer firepower and durability of the M808 Scorpion it is far more manoeuvrable, requires one crew member, and is equipped with regenerating energy shields along with many other features seen in Mjolnir powered assault armour such as the neural interface link, compact fusion power plant and shield generator. It's more commonly called the Mantis, and it's time that this beast gets a most detailed breakdown. Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and today we give the Mantis the most detailed treatment. The trailer for Halo 4 on MCC for PC dropped on the 10th. It's beautiful, and I promptly took to the comments section of that video and got involved in the discussion. I spoke to a few people, one of which being a person called Light, spelt with a Y. They asked what the next most detailed was likely to be. Well, it just so happened that I was torn between the Spirit Dropship and the Mantis, so I asked them which one to cover, and they wisely chose the Mantis. Kind of makes sense given that Halo 4 is live on MCC for PC tomorrow, being the 17th. So you have Light to thank for this coming as soon as it has, but don't panic, the Spirit Dropship is coming next. If you want to tell me what you want to see next, jump into Discord, link is below and engage with me. I tend to be online on the daily talking to anyone and everyone, it's probably one of the best places to catch me and get your voice heard. Also while we're on the subject, on the 17th tomorrow, when Halo 4 goes live for MCC for PC, I will be streaming the entire game over YouTube and playing through the campaign in my own detail oriented way. No face reveal until 100,000 by the way. So if you fancy joining me on the 17th for that playthrough, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you know that you'll be notified when it goes live. I'll confirm the exact time shortly. So with all that said, let's get on with this most detailed breakdown of the Mantis. The Mantis is a large bipedal walker utilised by the United Nations Space Command and developed by the Materials Group and Hannibal Weapon Systems. It is an extremely successful product that came out of the merged project Hrunting Yggdrasil, where innovations from the Mjolnir program were applied to other UNSC vehicles. The Mantis is 2.8 meters or 9.2 feet in length, 5.8 meters or 19 feet in width, and 5.7 meters or 19 feet in height, and has a mass of 5.2 metric tons, with a maximum speed of 55.5 km per hour or around 34 miles per hour. Her hull is mainly clad in olive drab armour plating with gunmetal and black articulators and underlying substructures. For a recent innovation, the Mantis has seen service with the UNSC Marine Corps, UNSC Army, Office of Naval Intelligence and private security forces including paramilitary outfits and police for riot control and demonstrations of force. During the Battle of Meridian between 2548 and 2551, the first prototype of the Mantis engaged in an action known as the Cherbourg Run. 
successfully engaging 18 heavily guarded Type 27 anti-aircraft cannons, which also bore the title of Mantis. The success of the prototype in the Cherbourg run is one of the theories behind the origin of the moniker Mantis. However, the Mantis was only introduced into widespread service after the Covenant War ended. And after the war had ended, the Mantis, at least initially, continued to be used only by very select, highly classified ONI units and the UNSC Infinity, which carried a number of Mantises by 2557. Since then, due in no small part by its success, the Mantis has seen deployment to more substantial fronts. However, since the emergence of Cortana and her created, it is unclear how many Mantises remain in service. The armour plating of the Mantis appears to be heavy ceramic titanium armour plating, making it incredibly resilient to damage from small arms and ordinary plasma weapons. However, it is still possible for infantry portable anti-armour weapons to inflict catastrophic damage. Additionally, the armour does not provide any special resistance to heavy plasma impacts and energy projectors. There has been no further explanation of what the ceramic titanium armour plating actually is, other than it being an alloy of titanium. That being said, the fact that the Mantis possesses energy shields, and very fine ones, very close to the hull surface, one would assume the material of the armour plating actually plays an active role in assisting the energy shield's function. Comparing many different materials that can be alloyed with titanium that provided desirable benefits for this function, I settled on the idea that the ceramic armour is likely a titanium diboride, being an alloy of titanium and boron. I'm not saying that is what it is, but at least from its material properties and the fact that it's got energy shields, it seems most likely. Titanium diboride is an extremely hard ceramic, which has excellent heat conductivity, oxidation stability and wear resistance. The combination of high hardness and moderate strength and relatively high density make it attractive as a ballistic armour. For a ceramic, it is also a reasonable electrical conductor. In fact, as with most ceramics, titanium diboride is a good semiconductor. A semiconductor material has an electrical conductivity value falling between that of a conductor such as metallic copper and an insulator such as glass. Its resistivity falls as its temperature rises. Metals are the opposite. Its conducting properties may be altered in useful ways by introducing impurities or doping into the crystalline structure. And when two differently doped regions exist in the same crystal, a semiconductor junction is created. The behaviour of charged carriers, which include electrons, ions, and electron holes, at these junctions is the basis of diodes, transistors, and all modern electronics. This means that the very armour plating of the Mantis likely functions very similarly to a computer system, and thus can likely be harnessed by a sophisticated enough control system to actually respond and react to the presence of the energy shield, assisting in its field integrity, coverage, and uniformity. This all adds to the shield's efficiency while not compromising on the raw ballistic properties of the armour plating, a fantastic hybrid of the two systems working in synchronicity, if I do say so myself. As with the energy shielding of the Mjolnir platform, the energy shields on the Mantis provide substantial protection from ballistics and energy-based weapons. Only at the end of the Human Covenant War were resources, facilities, funding and personnel made available to upscale the immensely successful energy shielding of the Mjolnir program. This innovation leapt forwards in the peace following the war, leading to energy shield implementation across various assets of the UNSC, one of which being the Mantis. For those of you who have been with me a while and have seen my most detailed breakdowns of the various Mjolnir platforms, you'll be intimately aware of the function of the energy shield systems. However, I also made the promise that if ever new information became available, I would make amendments to my statements about components I had to speculate on or pass educated guesses. Well, the energy shields are one such component where I will amend a few statements. This has mainly been due to my own personal research into small-scale nuclear fission reactors and current cutting-edge fusion technology, particularly orientated around electromagnetic fields. And since this is an integral component to the energy shields that we are most definitely aware of in a law capacity, I realised the principles in question also apply to energy shielding. 
the energy shield emitters, positioned across various points of the armoured hull of the Mantis, emit a high energy oscillating electromagnetic field tuned to specific frequencies to enable the field to completely envelop the Mantis's outer hull, just as with Mjolnir and with my previous statements on energy shielding. However, where before I suggested the electromagnetic fields envelop a high energy plasma, also emitted by the shield projectors, and this is then held in the EM field giving the shielding its protective properties, I now amend that statement to this. The oscillating electromagnetic field is the energy shield. There may not actually be a high energy plasma medium whatsoever. In truth, as very powerful EM fields can levitate even non-magnetic objects, the energy shield reduces the velocity of an incoming ballistic projectile to a near standstill. This sudden change in velocity induces extreme heat in the projectile mainly due to its own internal friction caused by the sudden change in inertia, thereby causing the rounds to thermally expand and destroy themselves, or flash vaporize. This is not without consequence however, the heat from this process as well as the distortion of the EM field induces a large amount of thermal energy which is carried by the EM field back to the emitters. The shield emitters are sensitive to too much heat, and once the shielding has taken sufficient damage the emitters shut down briefly as a safeguard to avoid permanent damage. But it isn't a universal occurrence, not every shield emitter will fail. Only the emitters nearest the attack are overwhelmed with the thermal energy and shut down, but this causes the entire shield to fail due to the now incomplete shield geometry. During this time, the shielding fails, and the residual electromagnetic energy around the armor plating bleeds off via high voltage static electrical discharge, showing the characteristic sparking we are all accustomed with. The pulsing we see from the shield emitters is caused by them attempting to start up again, but being unable until the emitters that shut down have dumped their excess heat and can reinitiate the shielding altogether. This enables the shielding to completely repulse ballistic projectiles until the aforementioned shield failure due to sustained fire and the buildup of backfeeding thermal energy. In the case of energy based weapons, the process is sped up due to the higher innate heat of energy based projectiles with overlapping effects from the projectile's own electromagnetism causing the shielding to fail more rapidly under plasma fire than ballistic. I believe this hypothesis more accurately represents the shielding characteristics and properties we have witnessed thus far and are particularly applicable to the Mantis as the Mantis's shielding is consistent in thickness across the entirety of the hull, appearing more like the hull itself is actually energized. There is a small gap, which is another reason I have amended my previous statement and not reverted to the Mantis having non-explosive reactive electric armor, which is a different technology altogether and would be quite useful on the Scorpion, but that's another video. The power source of the Mantis is the same micronuclear fusion pack that is utilized in the Mjolnir platforms. The fusion reaction takes place by taking two atoms of deuterium isotopes of hydrogen and fusing them together under very high pressures via extremely powerful electromagnetic fields. The result is a helium-3 nucleus and the release of huge amounts of energy. As with Mjolnir, the Mantis fusion pack measures 2 inches by 2 inches by 12 inches in size, half the size of the standard fusion packs carried by marines, yet able to produce all the power the Mantis needs, although it is likely due to the massive size difference between Mjolnir and the Mantis and the different movement systems that the 15 years usage the pack gets in Mjolnir is significantly shorter for the Mantis, before maintenance and replacement are needed anyway. The reactors are encased in a specially hardened casing so as to be as protected as possible from breach or damage. Each unit is also completely sealed, electromagnetically shielded, radiation proof, thermally insulated and shock mounted within the Mantis's inner hull with a failsafe system built in making it one of the safest applications of microfusion technology seen to date, whereby even if the Mantis is completely destroyed, the fusion pack remains intact, and an internal computational system will disable and shut down the fusion reaction should a Mantis be destroyed causing the nuclear process to end in a few nanoseconds, while also irreparably disabling the pack's ability to ever be used again. The actual movement systems appear to be provided by a plethora 
of different electric motor based actuators and additional gearing systems. This is evident by the characteristic motorized whine that can be heard when the Mantis is moving. The actuators and motors and gearing is able to generate an impressive amount of power given that the Mantis can carry its own weight of 5.2 tons, the full weight of a fully armored Spartan around a half ton, and still move at 55 km per hour. The Mantis is also capable of very powerful stamp functions in order to destroy, injure, or at least discourage any enemy daring enough to get close to its feet. The Mantis features an impressive advancement in the form of integrated human computer interface systems, similar to the one used on the Scorpion but with some notable differences, and much more sophisticated heads up display systems. The Mantis requires only a single person to operate effectively, and it achieves this by interfacing with the occupant via their neural interface. The basic function of a standard neural interface is to act as a friend or foe indicator, so that radar signatures will pick up the owner's signature and identify it as friendly. The most basic interface, known as the neural chip, is implanted at the base of the skull in all UNSC military personnel upon activation, but it can be replaced with a more specialized neural lace, should the need arise. The basic neural chip is completely embedded under the skin and possesses no external interface port, unlike the more specialized variations. It is likely that being a Mantis pilot necessitates that the basic neural chip given at enlistment is upgraded to a more sophisticated model, allowing the brains to interface directly with the Mantis. The user can then pilot the Mantis while simultaneously being able to target and fire its main armaments. The outer hull of the Mantis sport an array of sensors. These likely include sensors that relay information directly back to the user's neural lace, and possibly grant them a form of heads-up display for targeting and firing, or even a form of extrasensory perception granted by the neural interface. The neural interface allows a single crewman to effectively control every function of the Mantis, and it is possible that the interface also relies upon the pilot for the actual act of walking, taking sensory and motor impulses from the pilot directly, meaning that the Mantis would act as an extension to the pilot's body. But this is currently unsubstantiated, and it is likely that the Mantis's stick interfaces within the cockpit are for the purposes of movement, as there have been soldiers that have been overheard talking about inverted looking pitch in reference to these control sticks. There are two primary versions of the Mantis's weapon loadout, both of which have an anti-material machine gun on the right arm and a missile pod on the left. One variant has a larger caliber cannon and surface to air missiles, both of which at this time remain undesignated other than the information I've just given you. The other version has an M655 20mm heavy machine gun and an M5920 35mm surface to surface missile. There are other weapons that can be fitted to the Mantis's hardpoints, although these tend to feature on very specific variants of the Mantis, as the hardpoints do not have modularity, that is, they cannot be swapped out quickly and easily in a battlefield setting. It requires specialist armament by a team of qualified personnel. The Core Mantis is an up-armoured model used by the Liang Dormund Corporation. Liang Dormund occasionally loan their Mantises to local security forces for riot duty and shows of force. Their ammunition is usually replaced with non-lethal alternatives. The Corporation also employs non-combat variants that are used in their colony reclamation efforts for terrain navigating to mining operations. The Tundra Mantis is a variant designed for use in Arctic environments and has more armour than the standard core variant. The Woodland Mantis is a variant that features a woodland camouflage and more armour than the core variant. The Urban Mantis is a variant used by the UNSC Army and UNSC Marine Corps that features more armour than the core variant. The Oni Mantis is a variant used by the Office of Naval Intelligence that features more armour than the other variants, multi-environment homing missiles capable of locking onto ground infantry, and better heatsink shrouds for the heavy machine gun, meaning that the machine gun can fire for longer before overheating. The Hannibal Mantis is a variant upgraded by Hannibal Weapon Systems that features a rapid-fire Gauss cannon, experimental ion-field missile warheads that release several sub-munitions, and an ability to EMP other vehicles with a stomp attack. While it doesn't have as heavy armour as the Oni variant, it does have stronger energy shielding at the cost of recharge time. 
Isabel's Mantis is a heavily modified version of the basic model for use by the UNSC Spirit of Fire ground forces, with adjustments to reuse parts for the Cyclops and fronting Idrisil Mark II J Colossus. It also lacks the neural interface control systems installed on the basic model, something that was a necessary concession due to the older manufacturing technology on the Spirit of Fire. This variant's default weapon is a chain gun, but it can be replaced with a Gauss repeater. The missile capacity can also be upgraded. A shield requisition upgrade can be added to add shields to the Mantis. A target designator can also be added to the Mantis, so it can paint a single target to coordinate attacks using the local battle net and if a group of mantises are together they will smart target their designators. The Command Mantis is an upgraded variant with twin high energy lasers and fitted with an advanced energy shield. Nicknamed Theseus by Jerome092, his personalized Command Mantis is a mobile command post and line breaker unit that complements both his augmented physiology and leadership style. It incorporates one of the Spirit of Fire's command and control nexus relays enhancing Jerome's situational awareness of the battlefield and serving as a backup for the UNSC battle net should the ship be crippled or destroyed. The Mantis is a dominating and powerful platform to come across on the battlefield. Its ease of deployment from pelicans and even a direct drop into the battlefield enables the Mantis to be a quick deploy force amplifier, enabling local forces to gain a force superiority and be able to dispense and disperse even the most entrenched of enemy positions. Its very nature as a bipedal walker means it can traverse over ground much too rough for even the scorpion to move effectively over and bring to bear its impressive armament on practically any environment or theatre of war. With both the marines and the army putting in requests for the materials group to make different armaments, we can expect some very exciting innovations from the Mantis platform in the near and distant future. Thanks for watching. Stick your comments down below. I look forward to what you have to say. Remember, tune in tomorrow for the live stream of Halo 4 MCC for PC. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons Nick the Silent Cartographer, Brian, Sebastian, Red Sea, Darian, Stalker of the Realms, Falcon X003, Alvin, Mr. Fell, Flaming Halo, The Revanche, Starlight, Viking, Legions Lost, The TG7, TJ Jazz, Cat Herder Cam, Schneidish, and Leon, The Holders of the Mantle, my glorious reclaimers, my loyal Metarchs and all the other patrons that have jumped aboard to support the channel. You guys are awesome and all this would not be possible without you. Updates for your perks and benefits as well as a lot of the Halo Forge things are coming thick and fast over on Patreon, so be sure to keep your eye out for that. If you like Halo or Disgust to Insane Loves of Detail, hit that subscribe button and the little bell icon so you're told the second a new video hits the shelves. Be sure to support us on all major social media channels including Discord and if you really love the channel, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting the channel over there. It would mean the world to me and would free up more of my time for me to put into this content and other Halo-related goodness. Take it easy, everyone, and find peace in the domain.